52. America is experiencing massive growth and economic prosperity. The Studebaker Automobile Company is 100 years old in 1952. Cars like this Commander Sedan are competing head-to-head -head with younger, larger, and more agile car companies. And Studebaker, one of the most storied brands in automotive history, is about to become history. And yet... Well, that was their centennial year. They'd been building buggies and wagons and all kinds of uh, equipment like that. They built for the Civil War covered wagons that people don't last. Even the uh, Budweiser beer wagon was built by Studebaker. It was after the uh, Second World War, there was a good market for cars. They were making them as fast as they could. They had three assembly lines going. Things were looking pretty good for them. Actually, it's a very smooth car to drive. It's just a pleasure. We drive it everywhere. It's got a V8 engine and overdrive transmission, so it's smooth and uh, gives excellent fuel mileage. Al Jordan has owned his 52 Studebaker Commander for more than 30 years. He came to the brand reluctantly. Well, I used to have Thunderbirds. I had two of them, actually, and uh, they're a more expensive car and more uh, challenging to restore. They're very difficult to work on. These are much simpler. Everybody will give you a part if you need it. And when I get into it, the parts were so available, I couldn't believe that they were next to nothing. <laughs> I just kept buying parts because I couldn't believe how cheap they were. By the time Al bought his Studebaker in the early 70s, the company had gone under. Most of the dealerships, however, still existed. They just weren't selling Studebakers. So all across North America, there were warehouses filled with Studebaker treasure. Surplus stock, you know, it was before the days of computers, so Dealers just kept buying stuff and they didn't have good control. Most of the Studebaker dealers were very small, limited little dealerships, and so their inventory control was non existent. The Studebaker Company was founded in 1852. Eventually, it became the largest manufacturer of horse drawn wagons in the world. They finally began making horseless carriages in 1902. They dabbled with electric vehicles first, then switched to the internal combustion engine. Located in South Bend, Indiana, a long way from Detroit, the center of automotive manufacturing in the United States, the company struggled until it figured out how to build quality cars. By the 1920s, they'd opened plants in Detroit and Canada. The company managed to weather the Great Depression and World War II. But by the 1950s, the price war between Ford and General Motors was killing Studebaker sales. The 1952 Commander, a name they've been using since the 1920s, was meant to help celebrate 100 years of growth and prosperity. It became one of their last really successful cars. For Al Jordan, it's simply the most dependable, solid car he's ever owned. Well, things were a little different back then, and they used old porcelain terminals for the wires. And of course, it's got a big copper battery. It's using a Stromberg carburetor, which is something that disappeared a long time ago, but they were a very reliable carburetor. Uh, the rest of the components are the same as uh, most of your cars. It used Delco distributor and a Delco generator. And uh, it has solid lifters, so there's nothing. Once you set it up and tune it up, it'll stay running for many thousands of miles. Mid-range 
sedan, the Commander also had many advanced features that were only starting to find their way into the marketplace. A day-night mirror, tinted glass, and an innovative starter switch located under the clutch. Well, when you turn the key on, you just shove the clutch all the way to the floor, and it starts. It's handy if you stall it, actually. It has this that. also has hill hold. So when you stop on a hill, the car does not roll backwards until you release the clutch. And it's an adjustable, so you can set it up so it engages just as the clutch releases. The Studebaker engineers even invented an early version of childproof locks. The problem is that these suicide doors, as they were called, the back door, if it's open at speed, it will, uh, the wind will catch it and pull you right on out, and especially for small children. It was considered very dangerous. So one of the accessories on this car is childproof door locks. It uh, prevents the back door from being open till the front door is open. And you have to open the front door first before you can open the back door. A, a nifty idea. But by 1954, Studebaker was on the ropes. A strategic alliance with Packard actually scared buyers away. They smelled a car without a warranty. Finally, by 1966, one of the most storied brands in automobile history had been frittered away by bad management. But for Al, Studebaker truly is a success, despite its failure. When you own a Studebaker, everybody will tell you where there is one. And of course you go look at it, and next thing you know, you own it. <laughs> so I've had a couple that I've sold, moved on. But uh, I've been pretty lucky to always find some nice rust-free cars that are worthy of restoration. If you're going to buy a Studebaker, try to find one very rust-free. They're very lightweight car. They only weighed about 3,000 pounds to start with, so it doesn't take much rust to weaken the frame and the body till they get impossible to really fully restore properly. But other than that, the rest is pretty dependable. It'll run at today's speeds all day with no problem. You can drive them anywhere. And Al does. This is a 1941 Plymouth Road King, and it was one of the last cars built prior to World War II. And it was built in Canada, it's a Canadian car. And now I have another one over here, and this is a 1931 Chrysler. It's a CM6, and all the parts are here to restore it. And uh, it's also a Canadian car. But my favorite car of today is a 1928 Durant. Jasper Kaiser has a bit of an obsession. He only collects cars that were built in Canada. The 1928 Durant is a rolling reminder of how cruel the car business can be was the third kick at the automotive can for the company's founder, William Crapo Durant. It would also turn out to be his swan song. Durant was made in 1928, and it was made in Leaside, Ontario, by the Durant Motor Car Company. It was formed by Mr. Billy Durant, who was uh, quite an entrepreneur. You know, he made all kinds of uh, different companies. He started GM, but he made all kinds of stock and uh, then the companies sometimes didn't do that well because you know there were way too many car companies. Born in 1861, William Durant was an automotive pioneer. He founded the largest horse-drawn carriage company in the world. 
At first, he thought automobiles were noisy, nasty, dangerous things. He wouldn't let his daughter ride in one. But he had a revelation. If he could build a better, safer, horseless carriage, he might be able to make a buck. In 1904, he took over marketing for the Buick Car Company, and within four years, he formed General Motors. He began buying other companies to expand his product line, but his acquisitiveness alarmed his stockholders, and he was ousted as president of GM in 1910. Did he give up? Hardly. Ever a fighter, he teamed up with a Swiss-born race driver called Louis Chevrolet created another car company, then initiated what amounted to a hostile takeover of GM and became president again. Four years later, booted out of General Motors yet again by another partner, he decided it was time to start from scratch. He created another new company, this time naming it after himself. Maybe he thought if he used his own name, nobody would be able to snatch it away from him. What I like about it is that's made completely out of wood. And, you know, that manifests itself when you drive. It, it creaks and squeaks. If you look along here, you can see some of the little nails that, that, are, that, are, uh, that pull out as you drive. And then when you open the door, this is all the nails are all nailed on this wood frame. And all these panels, the, if you take these, this piece off, this panel is nailed to a wooden frame. And similarly, there's horse hair above here and, and that supports the roof. The uh, body was made by the Haynes Hunt Body Company. And uh, they put their tag right here with brass screws. And uh, I always make sure when I come back that, that it's always there when I come back. Cause it's, you know, there's not very many of those original tags left. Then I can show you inside the inside the hood. This is the original data plate. It's faded, but it was made in Leaside, Ontario, Canada. So it's a uniquely Canadian car, and that's what attracted me. Using the lessons learned with General Motors, Durant decided to build some of his cars in Canada. It was a financial decision. Cars built north of the border could be shipped into the British Commonwealth tariff-free. There weren't many of them built, and fewer survive. But as soon as he saw it for the first time 40 years ago, Jasper knew this was something special. I liked it because I thought it was uh, art. When I bought it, my father came over to me. We lived on a farm and, and I brought it home and my father said to me, you know, what are you doing with that old car? And I said, well, I like it. You know, can I, can I put it in the granary or not? And, oh yeah, he said, go ahead and put it in the granary. So I did and I kept it there for a number of years. And then I slowly, you know, I thought I would uh, to restore it myself. And I did, I scraped all the paint off and I did some of the mechanical work myself. I enjoyed it. It was in good shape. Need to be repainted and the spokes went, but as far as the 1928 goes, it was in, in good condition that I thought it was salvageable for me anyway. Like any car that's nearing 80 years old, the Durant can be occasionally cranky. If you don't follow the proper starting sequence and pulling the choke full out when you start and push it in instantly, then, then, you know, then it, it floods itself, and you, so you've got to watch that. You've got to really pay attention all the time. The steering is not self-centering, and it tends to wander. And it's it, with, with springs, and it's all mechanical brakes, and, and it, it drives like an old tractor. You start it up, and you run it through each gear, and there's no synchromesh. But it has tremendous power that has a long stroke in the engine. You know, you can leave it in third gear and go around the corner, and you're not hurting it at all. In spite of the crankiness, the car is pretty robust, and Jasper's not afraid to take it out on the road. I like the 
fact that it's the, the only 1928 Durant around, and it's unique, and it brings a lot of goodwill in people. We like to drive it around, and uh, people are always in a good mood when they see you. They love, smile, and uh, you know, and our family likes it. We go to a Canada Day Parade, and we go to church in it once in a while. And, and sometimes early in the morning, I'll take it for a drive in Wellington where I live and go to the beach and see how the fishermen are doing. And everybody, as they're getting up, they all wave. And, and that, that, that does it for me. You know, it's, it's kind of fun. Jasper's two-door Durant is one of only 12 known in the world. Of course, that shouldn't be surprising. Although they were tough little vehicles, most of them ended up on the scrap heap, as did Durant. The Depression pretty much killed off his company, as well as every other small and medium-sized car company in North America. William Durant spent the rest of his life managing a bowling alley in Flint, Michigan. He died in 1948, bankrupt. Even his mausoleum was paid for by a friend. These days, there are only a few cars that bear his name to remind us of his business genius and of his ties with a country that helped him launch his car company. I've told my children that whatever happens, I would like them forever to keep this car in Canada because I think it's it's part of Canadian history, and sometimes maybe we don't we don't look after that enough, you know. So I would love to see that. I would love to see it stay in Canada. Yeah. The vintage car collecting bug can bite unexpectedly, and it can bite hard. It's the one thing that I have been addicted to my whole life, and I can't tell you why. And sometimes you get totally tired of it. You wake up the next day and go, God, I, I, I can't get over it. I still like them. The old car detective Bill Shirk has spent decades tracking down vintage metal right across North America. He believes he has witnessed a pattern. We tend to lust after the cars that we thought were cool when we were kids. Some people collect a certain era of car, like a muscle car uh, or, or, or something earlier. And, and it often depends on when you were born and when you grew up. A friend of mine has a 1967 Plymouth Barracuda convertible, fully restored. His dad actually bought it in 1980. Then he took it over from his dad. He's now 48 years old. And uh, that's the car that really riveted him when he was, when he was growing up. That, that, that really meant a lot to him. So I think the, the ones that we remember from our youth the first car I ever loved is a 19.3 Cadillac that my father owned when I was a young boy. And I was so mad at him when he actually sold it. But it originally belonged to uh, Eaton's. Timothy Eaton owned it new. And we didn't even know that until after we sold it, which was kind of interesting. But I always thought that was the coolest old car. And uh, the one after that was a 1911 Ford my father owned. And I love a brass front Ford. Everybody has a Model T, they say, but if you have a good one, it's like an old friend. And I have a 10 that I'll never sell. The first car I ever fell in love with was a 1960 Austin Healey Sprite. And I was born in 61, so uh, in, in, the, in the late 60s, my Uncle Jack used to race cars. He owned British Motors in Monterey. And I just grew up with all the cool cars from that era. Jim Faulkner's dad also sold British cars out of his dealership in San Francisco. Actually, that's how I bought it. My dad was a used car dealer, he still is. And what happened was that uh, I drove it home a couple of nights and I, and I blew, ended up blowing the engine. And it was actually on the way to work. And uh, my dad was behind me about 15 minutes and saw me on the side of the road and says, with all the smoke and the oil coming out of the engine, he goes, looks like you bought yourself a car. And I still owe him 600 bucks for it. I never paid him. The first car that I owned entirely by myself was a 1940 Mercury convertible. It was tomato red and had a 57 Chev 283 V8 under the hood, but no floor. 
I had a date with a girl in the next town, and I drove over there. Now, I was desperately trying to be cool. Uh, a lot of guys in the 50s were trying to be cool, you know, with the collar, collar turned up and Elvis haircut, that kind of thing. So anyway, I figured the coolest way to arrive would be to pull right up on the front lawn and rev up the engine. That way she'd know I was there. So I rev up the engine. She comes out on the front porch and starts yelling, you set the front lawn on fire. Because the, the, uh, the, <laughs> the exhaust, mon exhaust monofalls were, were pointed straight down. And sure enough, the grass was burning, and I could see that right under the uh, right through where the where, where the floor used to be. So I backed the car up, stamped out the the fire, and then uh, and then she actually went for a ride. Sold it in 1962. Found the car 32 years later. Waited seven years for the owner to die so I could buy it back, and then it took another two years to realize I should not have bought it back because it was really rough. So I sold it to a fellow who had, who was about 40 years old. So uh, younger people are also into the older cars, but the general pattern I think is that the ones you remember from your youth. Despite the fact that cars from our youth were not always great cars, they're the ones we remember the best.